Thank you. Okay, I'd like to start by acknowledging um, the lands that we're on today, um, the lands of the Gabi Gabi and Jinibara peoples, and also the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation that we do most of our work on at the University of Sydney. I'd like to pay my respects to the first scientists on this land and elder, elders past, present and emerging. So, citizen science in schools. All of you in the room probably agree with me we need to do more of this. The things that we need more of to make this happen are more evidence that we actually get improved learning through citizen science and secondly, making projects accessible for schools. This is what I'm going to talk about mostly today. This is um, based on the Essential Medicines Project that we've been working with in a school for four years now. So I'll share some of our lessons learned and how we've gone about it. So, usually when we want to do citizen science in schools, we really want co-design. How that works is the researcher meets the teacher and then they co-design together. It's great. But unfortunately, that requires that both of these busy people have time. It means that we need them to have the same research interests. So an astronomer meets an astronomy teacher and we need their admin timelines to align. So ethics, research funding, curriculum, scope and sequence, assessment timelines. Sadly, that's really, really difficult. Um, I think we've come up with a really interesting workaround in our project. So I'd like to share a little case study on what we've done uh, in collaborating between a school and a citizen science project. So our project, what we actually started with was a little one day taster workshop where we as researchers led that workshop, but invited schools in to come and do the workshop. That meant that we got over a two year period, we ran it a number of times and we got a, little, a lot of really helpful feedback from teachers and students. And what it also meant is that we expanded our network and could actually find then a school that really wanted to take this the next step with us. So over the two years after that, we worked um, really closely with the science team at three different schools um, to implement our citizen science project in their year nine science biology and chemistry units. And we worked really, really closely with, with the school over that time to take all the resources we've started drafting and make it in, into a way that the school really needed. So the lesson plans in the format that they needed, we needed to change the language for each school. So we're actually using the words that they use in their classes and assessment. What's this, what this has meant is that now this is an ongoing project happening in their year nine science every year. It's now very much hands off from us and hands on for the teachers. They're the ones running it, which is really exciting. And what we can do now is focusing on little improvements that they ask us to make, but also on evaluation. Now we get that free time. Now we've built the partnership to work on some evaluation of the project. So a little bit about the context. Our project, as I said, is called Essential Medicines. It's a socio-scientific citizen science project where we're looking at the accessibility of the World Health Organization's um, list of essential medicines. And now this is a big list that everyone in the world should have access to. They include things like antibiotics, antifungals, painkillers. Unfortunately, not everyone in the world actually has access to these medicines and there's not very good data sharing on why or what the impact is. So that's where essential medicines come in. In three different challenges, we ask participants to give us that information. They find things they've found on social media, on the news, or they've looked up events in a medicine's lifetime that has impacted its access accessibility, and they send it back to us. This is where this curriculum alignment works really well for us because we've actually been able to pick medicines for the schools to investigate that act on the body systems that the students need to cover in year 9, 10, 11, 12 biology. So it's a really nice way to get the students to see how those medicines um, are really just chemistry and how it impacts their lives. I'd like to spend the second half of the talk talking to you about some of the three, some of the challenge we've, um, we've had to um, get around while working with the school. Um, Rochette Al wrote a lovely paper with a number of these challenges and I'd like to just give you some details on the three main ones that we've navigated. So the first one is goal alignment. We need to align with the school goals. What we found though is that that means quite a number of different things. So firstly, each school has to follow a curriculum. In Australia, that's usually the state curriculum. Some schools follow the Australian curriculum. 
Um, and then each school will have developed their own iteration of that in their school context. So what they're going to teach and when, and we needed to fit within that. Then from there, each school and teacher needs to be assessing things. So we found if we can find a way to make what we're teaching the students accessible, it's much more accessible for the schools. The next thing we found is that if we can align the citizen science project with the school strategic planning, they get a lot more support from school leadership and it becomes a whole school approach. So for example, things like community partnerships and industry partnerships are things a lot of schools leadership like to see and we can provide as citizen science projects. Next thing is it needs to align with the teacher's individual's teaching philosophy and goals. We found particularly if we have a team of teachers who's really excited to get the kids to really dig deeply into the scientific inquiry process, or if they want to take the students beyond what's in the curriculum, that will impact what we can teach with citizen science. The really important thing is that we're not adding any additional workload to the teachers though. The next thing that we found really interesting is the tensions between the curriculum and the project. And this depends a lot on the project you're doing. The first big question is like, what is science actually? You notice when I talked about essential medicines, we have a socio-scientific investigation. This is now part of the curriculum in Australia as part of science as a human endeavor, so it is there. But a lot of people have fixed concepts about what science is, so sometimes it can be hard to actually embed it in that space. The next big question is what actually counts as scientific research? In a lot of school settings, the easiest way to assess whether students can do science is by doing a controlled variable experiment. So there's independent variables, dependent variables, and we look for a correlation. Unfortunately, that can make observational studies, field work, data mining, and design experiments, so making new materials or medicines, actually really hard to fit into the assessment structure in many schools. That is slowly changing in Victoria, which is exciting. So we found in our project, what we really had to do was really closely align our project with the specific science skills that they were going to learn through doing our project. Um, and that really helped. Okay, last one is the quality data generation. This is an issue we've talked about already today a little bit. We've um, Papers have found previously that this is highly dependent on the study design, but what we'd argue is it's also really highly dependent on the design of the educational materials that you're working with. The three things we've found we need to really consider, firstly, the skills and knowledge students need for successfully engaging the project, and then also the learning conditions in the classroom they need to successfully engage. And by that, I mean um, these learning conditions. So on the left hand side, the student list is things that we've cultivated from a literature review of lots of um, citizen science engagement literature. In particular, what we've found is that relatedness to a community has been really important. The school community that we've worked with, one of them had a really um, high population of students from immigrant, immigrant backgrounds, one of them didn't. They wanted to cover very different medicines because they were interested in ones that were connected to their stories and their families. The next one is perceived autonomy. So whether the students are feeling like they have a choice, that's really hard in a school setting because usually the teachers have told them participate in this citizen science project. So giving them small choices where we can has been really beneficial in our project. For example, we get the students to choose one of a list of 10 medicines. So the choice isn't too big, but they get some control over that learning journey. We also get them to choose their research question. The next thing is the self-efficacy. So this is whether the students actually have confidence that they can give us something useful back. Um, that's been a really interesting one to contend with and we find giving them small tasks, particularly at the beginning of lessons that they can do well and they get that confidence up has been helpful. And next, the value of the contributions. If the school or the students and teachers believe that their contributions are really valuable to the project, they seem to be more motivated. The next thing that I've also seen, we've started to observe is really important is the collaboration with the teachers in the lesson design. They really like to have some autonomy over what you're going to do and when. So the collaboration we went through was really, really helpful for that. Um, we've also found teachers really wanna to talk to us about which medicines we're gonna focus on and for some of them, um, for some of them that's been things they're really interested in personally, some of them that has been things that they think the students in their class would be really engaged with. We've also found that giving teachers some autonomy and flexibility has been really, really beneficial. 
one of my favorite lessons in essential medicine so far was I was collaborating with the school one day and they took me into a few different classrooms to have a look. One of the teachers was doing a completely different lesson that we hadn't planned for at all. But that was amazing because he decided he really wanted the students to connect personally with what we were doing. And so he took the whole lesson to have a discussion with the students about medicines that are in their lives and whether they've always had access to them or not. So yeah, even though we're planning for them or with them to try and reduce that burden, still having some type of autonomy and flexibility has been really valuable. Okay, so in conclusion, to summarize, the collaboration we've done with educators has been really, really vital for the success of our project. It's taken a long time. You saw we started this in 2020, but now we have an ongoing sustainable relationship. Some of that heavy legwork of design is gone and we have time to work on what do we want to evaluate together. The next step is I'm going to sit down and work with one of the teachers in the next month and think about what student artifacts can we get from what they're doing in class that might tell us a bit about what they're learning. And we have time to do that together now this is in place. The next thing is think about starting with a taster. If you want to do co-design but you're struggling to find a school to do that with, running it in a small setting as like ours were sometimes an incursion or sometimes we run it online during COVID and lots of schools zoomed in. Um, starting with that to find the right partnership to go forward with has been really helpful. And then finally, put time into working out some of these key challenges that alignment with the school goals, resolving tensions between the curriculum and the project, whether that's what the science is or what the investigation is and your quality data generation. Okay, I'd like to finish by acknowledging some of the wonderful people who've been part of this project. Um, and in particular, the Learning by Doing team who we're now collaborating with to evaluate this into the future. And I'm of course from the University of Sydney and the School of Chemistry, and we get a lot of support from the Chemistry Education Communication Research team and our scope group run by Associate Professor Alice Motion. And finally, we've got some socials if you'd like to connect and hear about what we're doing next. Thank you. We have time for questions if, um, you, if people have other. Hi, uh, this is Luigi from Earthwatch. When you were uh, uh, explaining the process at the beginning, uh, there was a phase in which there was an interaction between uh, the researcher team uh, and the teaching team. Yeah. Um, I was thinking that uh, uh, researchers are very rare uh, resources. So uh, how do you scale up uh, this uh, to, I don't know, uh, thousands of schools uh, if you have a limited number of uh, researchers? That's a fantastic question. So how do you scale something like this up when we have so much collaboration at the start? I think you don't necessarily need this amount of collaboration for every project. I, I think there's probably a saturation amount of a number of schools or different contexts you'd need to work with to be able to develop a template that other schools could use and work with. Um, we've worked with three schools so far and hopefully that will start scaling up and yeah, maybe I'll come back and share with you when we've started figuring out, you know, what number of schools gives us good enough resources that we don't need to put this legwork in every single time and they can just chat to us about individual issues. So, good question, thank you. Is part of your work um, creating modules for the schools with the teachers at all or you just go in and provide a session and then that's all or is it an ongoing program with you? Great question. So the first iteration that you can see in the first section here was a one day program that we led. Over this period of time, it's now developed into, because the teachers need to teach different parts to fit it into their curriculum. So now I think it was 10 lessons, 10 hour long lessons in 2022. Um, some of those were things that we'd made but adapted for the schools and different teachers. Some of them were things that they brought in. And then I think it's now 16 at the moment as we add and bulk it out. And um, eventually if we can make it a whole term, we could even turn it into something like an elective that we can put on the New South Wales curriculum website and get people to use for that. So. Thanks. Um, I'm not sure if I missed it at the start, but how did you choose the school you were working
working with and were they a state or a private school and do you think there would be differences in those sectors for your project? Great question. So we have actually worked with a Catholic school and a public school and another public school. Um, we didn't actually really chose the, choose the schools. They chose us. So that's what was really good about this, running it a number of times and different schools coming in and people starting to talk about it. Eventually teachers approached us and said, I've heard about this thing and I want to work with you on it. And that was really good because then we had a really invested partner to move forward with. Um, there were some differences between the school settings. In particular, we needed to provide a lot more scaffolding for, I don't know if it's necessarily a public versus private divide, but if the academic level of the students is broader or lower, you need to provide more scaffolding. And we've worked really carefully on that with the schools. And I come from a teaching background like that. So we've been able to really scaffold that. And then with the schools that maybe, one of the schools was a selective school, giving them more options for extension and exploration. So yeah, you sort of tweak the teaching experience. I want to thank you again. Oh, one more. This is McKay down the front. <laughs> Helen and I work at the same school. Um, so your resources and the stuff aren't available. Like I can't contact you and say, look, we'd love yes, to give this a go in our school. Okay, excellent. We'll be in touch. <laughs> Any last questions? Thank you for sharing your work with us. That was amazing. Thank you.